Okay. We are streaming now. All right. We will start in four minutes. Sounds good. I will start now and talk with participants. Oi, gente, boa noite. Começaremos agora o quinto DigiLabel Conversations. O meu nome é Rafael Groma. Não sei se vocês estão é, me ouvindo, me, me falem aí se estiverem ouvindo. Hoje teremos a, a participação do James Steinhoff, que é pesquisador de pós-doutorado na Universidade de Washington e coautor do livro In Human Power, Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Capitalism, e que hoje vai falar sobre Autonomy or Automation, Digital Labor and Machine Learning Industry. Ok, James, nice to meet you. It's a great pleasure to have us today, and welcome to the DigiLabor conversation. You have... Uh, about 30 minutes to your presentation, and then the people ask uh, some questions to you. Sounds great. Good evening. All right, well, hello everyone. Uh, I wanted to say thank you to Raphael um, and everyone at DigiLabor for, for organizing this. Thrilled to be virtually there in Brazil. So um, today I, unsurprisingly want to talk about digital labor, um, but I also want to talk about the theoretical frameworks we use to think about how labor and digital technologies are connected. 
In particular, I'm going to talk about uh, labor in the contemporary artificial intelligence industry. And I'm going to talk about Marxist theories of digital labor. I mean, only a couple of them. Um, I'll be drawing in this talk on um, material uh, I've been working up for a forthcoming book, which is called a similar title to this talk, be coming out next year uh, uh, from Palgrave Macmillan. Then uh, the book will be called Automation and Autonomy, Labor, Capital and Machines in the Artificial Intelligence Industry. So here's a rough itinerary of what I'm going to try to cover today. First talk about uh, Marxist theories of digital labor, some of them. Second talk about the AI industry in general. Then we'll third talk about the labor process uh, around the form of AI called machine learning. And then a few insights uh, that I have drawn from learning about this labor process and this industry. So the first thing to say, um, of course, is that Marx was writing in a different technological era than ours. He saw the early days of steam powered machinery. So most estimates place the first use of the term automation, not until 1948 when it was used to describe a Ford Motor Company factory. But Marx had noted the phenomenon almost 100 years earlier, and he considered it a fundamental aspect of capitalism. For Marx, a capitalist economy is comprised of two key antagonisms. There are first um, numerous individual capitals which compete against one another. And then there's also a class antagonism between labor and capital as such. Both antagonisms compel individual capitals to increase their productivity. Historically, um, and today, the most effective way to do this has been to augment and slash or replace labor with machines. So in the 70s, Harry Braverman's influ influential study showed how scientific management or Taylorism had been applied by capital since the 1800s to increase control over de-skill and eventually automate labor processes in a variety of industrial and clerical contexts. He showed how before machines are introduced to replace labor, labor processes must be studied and broken down into their constituent parts. Once they're broken down, management can establish the one best way to do each part and machines can then be made to perform those functions. The automation of a labor process is thus preceded by its codification. Codification has historically been achieved in a number of ways. One of these famously is Taylorist time motion studies, which were applied to codify manual labor primarily. But in the 1980s, so-called knowledge engineers aimed to codify cognitive labor by interviewing skilled workers and encoding their knowledge and skills into automated reasoning systems known as expert systems. And it's around this time that Marxist thinkers began to assess the new kinds of work that were emerging around software. Many saw in software work the same processes of the skilling and automation noted by Braverman. 1981, for instance, the engineer and militant trade unionist Mike Cooley grimly asserted that, quote, Taylorism is destined for all computer work, as well as a range of other intellectual work, including science and technology. However, more recent Marxist studies of software uh, work seem to have changed their tune. It seems to me that the consensus is now that software work has qualities which render it resistant to both de-skilling and automation. According to a 2005 labor process, labor process analysis by Andrew Lair and Landry, uh, specifically studying startup production and software, so software production in a startup company. They say, quote, at every stage, human rather than machine intervention predominates. Each project requires fresh planning and decisions. This reality stands in sharp contrast to the one best way of tailorized work settings. 
Now they go on to assert that software production is dependent upon the skills of individuals and the synchronization of their disparate efforts in ways that management cannot implement from above. Therefore, they argue, software production is best understood as a craft. It just, it can't be codified in, in total. Therefore, uh, this kind of work is not threatened by descaling and automation in the same sense. They conclude, quote, to fully standardize computer programming would require the seemingly omniscient knowledge of both the emergent problems and the associated solutions. So it's just too complicated, too many unforeseen things arise. Now this evaluation of software production is echoed, I think, in different terms by another school of Marxist thought. This is um, post-operismo or what's been called autonomous Marxism in English, which advances the theory of immaterial labor. This has been a, a normal, enormously influential theory in the humanities and social sciences. And probably its flagship text is the one on the screen here, Michael Hart and Antonio Negri's Empire. To very briefly summarize, immaterial labor theory argues that the proliferation of information technologies, particularly computers, digital networks, is causing a socioeconomic paradigm shift. The basic idea is that the digitization of work is essentially incompatible with capital, capitalism. So immaterial labor is described by Maurizio Lazzarato as post-Taylorist production. It involves human elements, including communication, affect, which cannot be automated. Hart and Negri are explicit about this uh, in their most recent book together, 2017, called Assembly. They say that we shouldn't be too concerned about a new quote unquote digital Taylorism, because even if it quote, sometimes seems as though computer systems, artificial intelligence and algorithms are making human labor obsolete. In fact, there are innumerable digital tasks that machines cannot complete. According to the theory of immaterial labor, the technological balance of power that historically favored capital is in the process of shifting in favor of labor, which becomes able to produce value on its own. Hart and Negri thus uh, assert that immaterial labor becomes increasingly abstract from capital. That is, it has a greater ability to organize production itself autonomously. So the proliferation of information technology means autonomy for labor. And, and it paves the, way, uh, paves the way for a transition to post-capitalism. But is this the case? And how would one assess it? These are big claims. Um, I figured a good first way to assess it would be to look at contemporary work in the artificial intelligence industry. Here we have data scientists and engineers producing cutting edge software. And this should be the epitome of immaterial labor. These kind of uh, workers enjoy benefits, extremely high wages, all kinds of perks. Their highly skilled labor is, is quite rare uh, in, the, in the market and hard to replace. And so they possess considerable bargaining power. And if software work like this is in fact difficult or impossible for capital to control and automate, this would seem to be a promising direction for the future of work from the perspective of labor. If all work trends towards immaterial labor, then the strength of labor is set to increase via V capital. However, my research leads me to believe that data, this type of data science work in the AI industry is in fact undergoing familiar processes of de-skilling and automation. And I'm gonna talk um, about why I think so drawing on interviews that uh, I conducted with people working in this industry. But first, let's talk a little bit about the AI industry in general. So I became interested in this topic around 2015. AI was beginning to appear in the news uh, frequently around then. And I had been reading previously about the theory behind AI, a philosophy of AI, when I started to wonder how AI actually gets made and who makes it. 
I quickly realized that the major force in AI was industry, not academia. And this piqued my Marxist interest. So it was around 2010, probably, that capital became very interested in AI and is now heavily invested in it, right, in the intervening 10 years. All of the biggest tech companies in the world, um, from predominantly from China and USA, have pivoted to AI intensive directions in the past 10 years. This includes all the big names, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, IBM, and in China, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent. Even older industrial capitals such as Siemens and General Electric are now following suit. And around these big capitals are a variety of startup companies. So I refer to this whole thing as the AI industry. Um, you might argue that it's just an increasingly favored subset of the larger tech industry. Uh, you, you wouldn't be wrong, I don't think. So the contemporary AI industry is focused around a technique called machine learning, as you may know. Um, machine learning uses statistical methods to extract complex patterns from large quantities of data. Such patterns can then be applied to generate predictions on new data. This basic function uh, has found a wide variety of applications already and more continue to appear in almost any field where large quantities of digitized data are available. Commentators such as uh, the MIT economists, Eric Brynjolfsson and Andrew McAfee uh, have argued that AI and machine learning AI in particular is a general purpose technology comparable to the combustion engine or electricity. Whether or not that will turn out to be true uh, remains to be seen, but it doesn't seem totally impossible to me. Um, so the AI, AI produced by companies in this AI industry is intended for profitable sale. This is what's often overlooked, I think, but, um, or to otherwise augment the valorization of capital. So AI commodities can be produced for consumer commodity markets, um, such as home speakers, uh, Google, Amazon have options of these. Um, but more significant are the AI products intended for use as fixed capital. These are products which other companies might employ in their, their business operations. It could be image recognition software, predictive analytics, sentiment analysis. Um, these are all available through platforms like Google Cloud, Amazon Web Services. You, you buy them from the big AI companies. Um, Perhaps, uh, not, not to be forgotten, perhaps the most familiar type of AI though, produced by the AI industry or the most commonly encountered kind of AI is the AI that is evolved in free services, ostensibly free services, such as Google Maps or Translate. Um, as is well known now, these free services are actually provided in more or less tacit exchange for the appropriation of user data. Um, they're used to collect data for AI and they also use AI in their functioning. So who works in this industry? Well, like other sectors of the digital labor force, there's massive stratification. This is a schematic breakdown here. Uh, if you've read Mary Gray's, or if you watched Mary Gray's talk a few weeks ago here uh, at DigiLabor, or if you've read her excellent book with Siddharth Suri, you'll be aware of how essential uh, what they call ghost workers are for preparing the data sets necessary for machine learning. Um, we also include service workers here because they're essential to the industry. Uh, and considering these, the ghost workers, service workers is very important, uh, it's studied digital labor. But my focus is on going to be on the opposite end of the spectrum here, uh, looking at the, the data scientists, the engineers, like I said. So I did some interviews in 2017, 2018, interviewed data scientists, machine learning scientists, uh, data engineers, and CEOs of AI startups. Um, CEOs in tech you know, at large and AI often have technical backgrounds on par with the technical people in the companies. Um, almost all my interviewees had master's degrees, nearly half had PhDs. Um, so this is a highly educated group of people. Um, as you know, as you may know, it was predominantly white white men, um, and they earn they earn very big salaries. Generally, the average yearly salary for data scientists in California last year was around one hundred fifty thousand U.S. 
um, and even higher salaries are possible uh, with this, the upper limit being hard to say, right? Uh, if you're if you're a celebrity uh, or a famous researcher, you could command, you know, figures in in the millions, presumably. Um, these massive wages are one reason why industry predominates uh, or dominates academia in AI. So I have enough time to look at the macro level dynamics much in much more detail than that. Um, but let's zoom in now to the labor process in particular. So some commentators uh, have described machine learning as a sort of Copernican inversion in software production. For Pedro Domingos, um, machine learning is the quote, inverse of programming, because with it, algorithms uh, make other algorithms. Computers write their own programs so we don't have to, end quote. Um, this kind of discourse, uh, well, it's important to point out this fundamental difference here uh, tends to obscure how much human labor remains necessary for the production of machine learning systems. Very schematically, um, machine learning involves obtaining and preparing a data set, applying a learning algorithm to it, which produces a model, another algorithm. And this algorithm can then be used to analyze new data sets and make useful analyses or predictions. So this involves at least five sort of main stages. You have to collect the data because uh, you need to find relevant data for the problem at hand. You can't extract useful patterns from data if there is no suitable data. Um, and then of course, data has to be processed. Uh, I think it's pretty well known now that ready, ready to use data just is not found in the wild. Um, what is perhaps less well known is that this is the, the, the bulk of the labor process here. According to one study by, uh, from 2016, data scientists spend up to around 60% of their time cleaning and organizing data. Now, actually building the machine learning models takes up only 7% uh, of their time, according to the same study. Um, so then a completed model needs to be deployed, which is integrated into some sort of existing business operation, website or something. Um, and then the, these models need to be maintain, maintained. Um, they need to be checked in an ongoing manner uh, to see if they're still accurate. So this sounds like it's broken down into these nice steps, um, but in practice, my interviewees described a much more convoluted, uh, messy process, with a lot of unpredictabilities. And as I mentioned earlier, previous Marxist analyses of software production have described it as complex communicative process, relying on judgment, intuition, and craft knowledge. One software engineer I, I, I spoke to described the machine learning, the machine learning labor process as a hyperbolic version of that. He told me, quote, a long quote here, but it's, 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 it's very interesting. So please bear with me. He told me, there's a lot of dark art to the design and layout of a neural network. You have this expectation that data is going to flow through this graph in some way, and you're going to update these things. And there's some relationship between the shape of the layout of this graph and the quality of the outputs that come through it. What is that relationship? Nobody has more than a cursory understanding. Well, we know how to make it really, really bad. We know what not to do. And if we want to get better performance, we can tweak it a little bit, but we don't actually have a firm model or theory behind it. So according to this account, the machine learning labor process requires experimentation and guesswork because not even experts know exactly what needs to be done. This would seem to suggest that this kind of work might indeed possess a special kind of autonomy. How could management attempt to control such a quote, dark art of a labor process, which even experts only achieve through trial and error? Well, I'll discuss three ways drawn from what I learned from my interviewees. First is what I'll call the commodity form of AI. Despite the ambiguities of the, the machine learning labor process, since the products it aims to produce are intended to be sold for profit, capital is like any other industry, uh, any, other, any other sector um, compelled to try to control the process as much as it can. Thus, it's um, subject to a number of temporal uh, and social pressures from a variety of stakeholders. So my interviewees described 
being given, like they definitely possessed a, a limited autonomy to use their particular software tools, languages, et cetera, at their own discretion. But they also described long work weeks ranging up to 80 hours, which are familiar to other kinds of software production, along with these the periodic um, death marches, or so they're called periods of hyper intensified work before deadlines or in the wake of breakdowns. But the AI industry also exhibits some distinctive temporal dynamics. As a very new industry driven by aggressive competition, its tools are constantly evolving. Standards, best practices remain in flux. This means that data scientists are continually engaged in learning. They reported uh, continual, continual learning, completing varieties of uh, free and paid um, courses in their free time, for instance, a lot of research often in their free time as well. My, my interview is also reported being subject to social pressures from a variety of stakeholders. These stakeholders often have the ability to direct uh, the work of the data scientists from above. Um, many reported being subject to upper management or venture, venture capital investors who ultimately exercise um, great power over their work. Others reported um, who operate a sort of consulting type business model reported that their customers consistently intervene in the labor process, right? Um, one data scientist told me he spends 40% of his time responding to ad hoc requests coming from clients. So in all of these ways, the commodity form of AI impinges on the labor process. The second dimension of management influence here is what, uh, what is called empirical control. So software development um, is now famous for non-traditional management practices epitomized by posh Google campuses. But this doesn't mean that there are no management strategies. Um, the traditional software development methodology originally coming from industrial manufacturing is the waterfall model which you see here. This describes a series of detailed steps which a project proceeds through from conceptualization to deployment. But as early as 1970, it was recognized as risk, risky in the context of software production because software production just has too many variables to be plotted out rigorously by management. And uh, machine learning production only increases this uncertainty. So software uh, production and, and machine learning uh, has a lot, uh, has predominantly adopted different methodologies now. Uh, one of these most popular ones that I heard about is called Agile. So Agile is a, an iterative and incremental process. Rather than one uh, series of steps, it entails a series of sprints, uh, as they're called, which are between a week and a month long. Each uh, small goal is, is to be accomplished in each sprint. Um, there are a thousand variants of Agile, but uh, a very popular one uh, that I heard about is called Scrum. The, the developers of Scrum describe interest, interestingly as a quote, management and control process and a quote, kind of social engineering. The central point of Scrum is that a development team receives orders from upper management, but receives full autonomy to decide how to implement them. Managers are repurposed uh, and their main task is to run a daily Scrum meeting where developers report on their progress on a series of agreed upon goals. Um, and the workers are, are made to engage in commitments with other workers and managers to complete their, their specified goals within uh, a sprint. So the striking thing about this is that some of the early developers of Scrum compare this method to the automation of chemical plants. So they use this following example. Um, chemical processes which are fully defined can be fully automated. However, some chemical processes are complex. Knowledge about them uh, is lacking, De details lacking. And these processes can only be completed through ongoing empirical observation, minute by minute. This is what they call empirical control. And it's the idea behind Scrum. Scrum is implemented with a special array of uh, tools. One of these that I heard a lot about was um, a project management software called JIRA, J-I-R-A. So JIRA includes, quote, feature rich time tracking and the option for automatic screenshots as frequently as every minute so that management can, quote, get accurate timesheets for the whole team. 
So real-time surveillance of this kind, uh, along with the constant check-ins, like the daily check-ins, meetings, reporting on, on minute tasks, um, this allows for a sort of panoptic kind of, of management and control. Now, the third instance of management influence I want to discuss is the de-skilling and automation of this type of work. Now, I was quite surprised to hear from my interviewees that the kind of work that they do is already being subjected to forces Harry Braverman would recognize. Automation, however, uh, it needs to be noted, has an interesting ambivalence in software production. For some of my interviewees, automation is a useful fact of software work because it allows them to focus on more interesting tasks. One data scientist told me, as a programmer, uh, if you keep doing the same thing for six months, you have to start thinking of automating. We should always move towards automating. Um, and however, uh, even recognizing the utility of automation, uh, other data, sci data scientists are concerned about longer term prospects. One programmer told me that it was very likely that his job would be automated soon because, quote, most of programming, let's say 70 to 80% of programming is drudgery. It's a lot of moving around code, doing all sorts of nonsense. All of that is going to go away, end quote. So I was especially um, surprised to learn about this technique called automated machine learning or auto ML. Now this, this refers to the automation of the process of producing and deploying machine learning models. Uh, and it's achieved through the application of machine learning to this process in a sort of recursive uh, application. And what, when I first started hearing about this during my interviews, um, this was an experimental technology for the big tech giants. Uh, but in the, the few years since then, it has now become a commodity or the basis for several commodities on the market. Um, there are auto ML applications to automate aspects of all of the uh, different steps of the labor process that I mentioned earlier. Although uh, model building and data preparation seem to be the most uh, successful areas of application so far. But beyond the particular details, what I think is interesting about this technology is that it is often being, a, being applied to automate steps of the labor process which have not been codified because they rely on uh, the, the so-called black arts of intuition, guesswork, trial and error. Um, Auto ML overcomes this lack of codification through brute force. By this, I mean that uh, in, in general, these applications work by generating, based on some existing data, potential candidate neural networks, for instance, and then subjecting all of these different candidates to an array of competitive tests to determine which performs best. Uh, and then, you know, creating variants off from these and, and, and so on and so on. So this technique can automatically explore thousands of options in the time it would take, you know, human experts to explore only a few. And some of these tools are, are even intended for non-experts. There are even uh, one-click uh, automated machine learning products out there. So we seem to have, an automa have automation occurring without preceding uh, codification. So I'm calling this synthetic automation, at least for the time being. And this is an unexpected development from the perspectives represented in current Marxist scholarship on software work. Um, but, it, but it seemed like a logical, completely logical progression to a software engineer I spoke to. He told me that, quote, automating this process of exploring, trying different types of networks, it seems very natural to me. So there seems to be a substantial gap between what practitioners and theoreticians are thinking about this. Um, now, it's, it's true that machine learning is surrounded by all kinds of hype and that uh, auto ML is probably the next thing to receive all kinds of hype. Um, but it seems to, you know, to this non-expert uh, that something interesting is going on here. Um, 
just last year, near the end of last year, or some point in last year, Google's AI lab demonstrated what they call a full automation or end-to-end -end auto ML system. Um, this thing produced uh, as, it's, as an output, a working machine learning model. And the only inputs they said are data and computational power. The whole process, according to the Google AI blog, requires no human intervention. So this system took second place in a grandmaster level Kaggle contest, which involved predicting manufacturing defects for batches of automotive parts. Um, it's not, you know, it's not on the market yet, but it'll be interesting to see how this technique progresses. Uh, historically, automated programming has had very little success, as I understand it. Um, will that change with machine machine learning? I don't know. What will that entail for the high-end, uh, highly remunerated, high-skill software work of the people that, that do this kind of work today. So uh, I will uh, start to wrap up here. So I just spoke about three ways in which um, there is management influence over the labor process of data scientists. In the, in the AI machine learning industry, labor process, machine learning labor process. Um, these indicate to me that the, at least some of the existing Marxist scholarship on software production overestimates the novelty of this type of digital labor. Uh, I'm not saying there's no novelty at all. Uh, that's not what I'm saying, but we have some labor process theorists and we have immaterial labor theorists arguing that software work represents a break with previous types of labor insofar as it is not amenable to direct control by management. And thus, uh, it, it, you know, it, it, it's evidence of an emerging autonomy from capital. My argument is that work in th th this, this work in the AI industry that I've looked at, um, it doesn't support those those analyses and in, in fact it appears as a a new or another case of uh, the de-skilling and automation of labor marx uh karl marx famously used the term uh, real subsumption to refer to how capital technologically recomposes labor processes into a specifically capitalist form uh, automation is is the primary manifestation of real subsumption and it seems to be automation rather than autonomy, which characterizes the production of machine learning. Um, maybe this sounds grim or overly pessimistic, uh, but I think this perspective needs to be elaborated. Uh, and I think it is a necessary counterpoint to optimistic analyses around digital labor. Um, so I want to leave plenty of time for questions. So I, I won't say any more. Um, if this topic is of interest to you, uh, as I said, it will be developed into a book next year, uh, published by Pelgrave Macmillan. So, uh, please do check that out if it's something that interests you and thank you. Thank you very much. Amis, it was amazing. I have your last book, uh, here. Thank you. Nice one. Uh, and uh, the first question is, is mine. Uh, how to face automation from a Marxist perspective? In a, 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 like a research agenda for the future. Okay. Um, well, the... Uh... I guess, I guess, I guess with ambivalence, um, because the history of Marxist thought, uh, you know, especially in Soviet Marxism and, and Orthodox Marxism recognized the value of automation, right? Um, and, and this goes back to Marx, where technology is neither good nor bad, and, and automation is neither good nor bad, because you want you presumably, uh, from a Marxist perspective, do want to eliminate some kinds of work. And automation, you know, can get rid of bad kinds of work. 
not all work is rewarding, not all work is enjoyable, not all work needs to be done by people. Maybe we, you know, maybe we can dispense with a lot of the unpleasant stuff. Um, but yeah, the whole point is that whether automating is by automation is being dictated by the valorization of capital or or put to another end, I guess. I think that's the simplest way to put it. Uh, a, a socially determined end. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the next question from from Claudia Hebeck, uh from Brazil. The term of AI has become a nar narrative spread by man manufacturing corporations in Brazil as something inevitable for this future future of work. But at the same time, these companies invest little in AI in their own production system. What do you think about this? So if I understand correctly, it's a lot of companies talking about AI um, and not actually incorporating it into their operations in Brazil? Yeah. The, the, the AI discourses uh, put AI has uh, something inevitable for the future of work. I see, I see. But yeah. in practice is in another way. Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, AI is, is certainly being used as a a way uh, of uh, a technological justification for business as usual, uh, in the sense that business as usual is delegating uh, control to management in in every sector where that can happen, uh, and that, as that being the best way to do things. So, yeah, if if AI sounds like the new sexy thing, it'll get used just like big data was before it. Um, and really, machine learning is, you know, kind of like a second manifestation of of all the big things that big data was supposed to do for us, uh, and relies on the same sorts of. Uh, well, it relies on the same sort of statistical reasoning and, and, and correlate re reasoning by correlation. Uh, from collected data, and so it has all the the, the, the premise, the, the promises, I guess, and then the overhyped aspects that big data did, I think. And in that sense, it's not completely new <laughs> in terms of how it's being mobilized by by every single company who wants to sound modern and, and sexy. I'm not sure if that answered the question. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, the next question, what is a communist AI? That's a big question. Uh, it's a good question. And I, I've been thinking lately about um, what, what, I, what I've been calling the, the reconfiguration of AI. And if people are familiar with the journal EndNotes, uh, Jasper Berna's there talks about uh, in an argument with, well, yeah, a, a discussion with Alberto Toscano about how to or whether the technology produced by capital can be uh, reappropriated, reconfigured for Marxist, communist, socialist ends. Uh, and and Bernas is very compelling argument there is that not all technologies may be useful in that context or desirable in fact that has to be determined and then shouldn't just be assumed uh so that's been something i've been I, i've been thinking about uh ai historically uh in marxist thought at least since the 80s um there have been people who have have argued that it, it was it, it will be useful or it could be useful uh in running a, a, a centrally planned economy, right? Um, this is supposed to be tried in Chile, uh, right, uh, as well. Um, people like Col Paul Cockshot have talked about this and con continue to talk about supercomputing, AI, big dating, uh, big big data as uh, essential for a socialist economy. Uh, and 
but the, there there are many ways that um, contemporary machine learning can be used. And an interesting argument that I've read recently was uh, concerning facial recognition, uh, machine learning for facial recognition. And some people have argued recently that that is just a technology we shouldn't have um, and that we should treat it like chemical weapons or something and relinquish it. So that is also a possibility uh, that we might not want the intense fine-grained surveillance and tracking that AI can enable in, in a in a you know socialist or communist society. Great. Uh, thanks. The next question from Olga Zunino. Uh, she asks how the automation process can affect the field which they are producing their softwares. For example, social bots for political and consumption purposes. The developers which you interviewed have spoken about that. Sorry, Rafael, can you re repeat that? I, I didn't hear the first uh, the first bit. Okay. Uh, how the automation process can affect the field which they are producing their softwares. The, the question that in test is, is here in chat. Okay. Okay. How the automation process. So is, is this asking about the field? Uh, no one I interviewed was working with, with bots particularly. Uh, the, the people I interviewed were working in a variety of applications, um, but no, none were actually working in, in anything directly social media-y. Um, a couple were actually explicitly not because they didn't like the ethical implications of working with that. Okay. The next question from Daniel Marques from Brazil too. How would you place the global south within the AI industry? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, and I something I need to uh, read more about is is what's going on outside of the center of the AI industry. That's you know that's that's something I, I need to read about in the near future. Um, the fact the fact is that the AI industry is extremely comp is extremely concentrated, right? It's 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 the U.S. and Canada or the U.S. and uh, China primarily. I honestly can't tell you what's happening. I know there are startups all over the world uh, that contribute to the AI industry and are doing important stuff, but I don't have that information. Maybe the ghost workers are not concentrated. And the, yeah, that that's true. Uh, yes. So I'm thinking about the, <laughs> the people that I interviewed. But yes, the, the, the ghost workers are, from what I, from what I understand from the, the research that's out there, um, distributed all across the global south. Uh, and I know a bunch of the um, automation, like automation is being directed at that work as well, not just at the, the high end of the pay scale. Um, Surprisingly, I mean, despite um, the the exploitative wages that these people are receiving, right, are, they're already extremely low. One might expect that they might not be the target of automation in the same way that extremely well-paid data scientists would be. Um, so, for instance, people who are doing the things like labeling, labeling photos, uh, and that sort of thing for for machine learning, image recognition software, uh, there are. It's a startup from India, I believe, working on on automating that very process. Okay, thank you very much. I think it's it's okay. I will.
in video now <laughs> James, okay. with, with your new book thank you uh, again your work and the nick die with the ford is uh, amazing it's very important to us in in brazil and i invite you and everybody to next digital labor conversations with jamie woodcock from thank open you. university uh next monday 5 p.m brazil time and the theme is digital workerism technology platforms and circulation of workers struggles is uh, a, a research of jamie woodcock and Callum kant uh, from england uh, to queridos brasileiros brasileiras nos despedimos por aqui é, de mais um Digi Labor Conversations. Hoje a gente é, depois ficará essa conversa gravada aqui no nosso canal no YouTube. É, Inscrevam-se na nossa newsletter. Na semana que vem, às 5 horas da tarde, então conversaremos com o professor Jamie Woodcock, da, da Open University, e que vai lançar no Brasil um livro em português em outubro chamado Marx no Fliperama, que vai sair pela editora Autonomia Literária. Muito obrigado a vocês, boa semana, até mais. 